Thank Jim, you. welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on finally. Yeah, no, thanks for the invite. It's been no, a struggle to get him on, isn't it? It has, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's our fault as well. Um, no, but it's good to have you here finally. Obviously, if anyone doesn't know, I'm sure everyone does know, Kitchen Town Manager. Um, we're going to go back before the last result. We'll touch on a few guests before that. Yeah. Um, how's Owen? Mm. Um, it's a massive win there. Yeah, it was. It was um, we went there knowing that they had the best home record in the league. And obviously, where we were situated, it was just a, almost a free hit we looked at it um, they were a really good side and um, you know we just wanted to ensure that we <laughs> give a good account of ourselves and obviously getting a win in the 97 minute is, is ideal so um, the best time to win this level yeah but it was perfect really so it gave us a big lift um, and uh, you know unfortunately we weren't able to follow that up no what was um, so I heard you wasn't there on the sideline for the for the goal no, so yeah. <laughs> sounds so, like Sam behaviour. Yeah, yeah. no, it does sound like Sam behaviour, although, <laughs> although it wasn't me. It, no. So, um, so basically, what happened? There was um, a situation where the ball near the dugout looked like it went out of play. Mm -hmm. They looked like a handball. So there was a little bit of frustration from us, from our players, uh, as the ball transferred across the other side. One of our players shouted something at him. As the ball went out of play the other side, he ran over, spoke to the linesman for about a second, walked over to me and said, you can't call me that, and gave me the red card. Nah. Okay. So I was like, confused, baffled, but um, yeah, I, I actually didn't say anything. It, it's not the way that I usually conduct myself in a certain way. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, did, I didn't say anything, although you know, I took the punishment and, and actually walked around and um, kind of watched it in their, their shed, which is which is like the non-league cop, I, I'd imagine, with mm, yeah. all their fans. and uh, seen that one before, yeah. Yeah, to get that goal then, it was, it was class, because it was very quiet, apart from me and a couple of the coaches, so it was, it was good. What was, obviously, I know they're going to be big, but what celebrations amongst the lads? Obviously a massive win like that, was it? <laughs> Yeah, I think um, for them, they've not won a lot of games this season. So it's almost like sometimes, oh, what are we doing in this situation? It was just elation at the time. You know, the lads run over to the fans behind that goal um, and pretty much after they'd scored, the centre was taken and the game was finished. So it was just literally back over to the fans, applaud them and off we came. So spirit in the change room was great. And, uh, you know, I think really though, it's just about you know, not getting carried away, being grounded and try and look to work hard and do it again. So, it, you know, for us, it was just one game, but a really good win. Yeah. Obviously, you did back up with a, a draw at Alvin Church. Mm. Um, it's always a tough place to go, though, isn't it? Yeah, Alvin Church was difficult because they uh, had a man, a man sent off early. Hmm. And sometimes you see in football, 10 men are almost difficult to break down in 11. You know, they, they sat in quite deep, um, made it difficult for us. We did take the lead, but then conceded in the second half, weren't able to get past um, their keeper, who is online from West Brom. He, he was really great on the, on the day. So uh, we took a point away from home. But again, you know, sometimes anyone in football will say if you can get point away from home and, and win your home games, ideal. So we, we weren't too... Um, too hurt by it but um, you know it's just trying to get that consistency at the moment I think with that team as a club as well I think they've got a very good scouting system there as well I think they've got a lot of uh, yeah. people out on the ground looking for their players so. yeah and uh, for them as well they're, they're kind of in and around us so they're, they're mm. just in in and around the relegation zone so they're having to look at a different ploy with catchment areas using West Brom mm. or whoever it is around those just to try and use the loan system a bit would you say um, obviously you catch you in the wrong end of the table um, but what's the belief like within the squad is it is, is it good feeling within the squad at the minute yeah when I came in as assistant um, with Andy first of all we didn't know really what to expect so I went in open minded really clear that the group of lads were tip top really mm -hmm. great group um, you wouldn't have known that they are in the position that they were which is a good sign as far as that's that's concerned. My first game was away at uh, Leaston, so it was a long coach journey, um, and so I could get to know the lads a little bit closer then, being part of it, and it was just clear that they were just great, and probably if you looked at that group there and then and had to guess where they were, it wouldn't be you know down, down in that, uh, that zone. So belief is still there, it's just about trying to you know perform consistent, uh, consistently. The problem probably has been performances at home or results at home aren't that great. So when you're performing in front of six, seven, eight hundred fans and not getting the result, then some of the players, you know, might feel that pressure. Um, so probably, you know, no, uh, 
you know, no hide in the fact now that the away form is, is better than the home form and, mm-hmm. and that could be down to mentality of some of the young players. So, you know, it, it's just about getting that belief and instilling that uh, that right mindset, really. So when you when you first joined the club there with Andy, um, first of all, what, what was your expectations of Andy like as he came in? Yeah, so um, the, the season, uh, to be fair, I've always had a relationship with Kettering. So ever since I started managing, really, um, I was a player at Kettering back in the day as a, a youngster. So I knew the setup through the youth. So for me, it was just about can I offer a stage for some of their younger players to perform on? So I always had that relationship. So last season, it was with Lee Glover, Luke Graham within the academy. We had Luca Miller, Kai Little, Josh Drain, um, and. Uh, it was all about trying to give those youngsters a chance so we built a relationship with with Ketchum and then obviously when Andy came in that relationship then continued Mm -hmm. Um, and he then would sometimes because of the locality I think from from him being more south he would sometimes bounce ideas and and players names off me and it, it just became a trusting relationship so at the time where I think he lost his assistant manager and he felt he needed to bring someone in. That That's kind of where it went. So I built up the, that relationship already. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but then working with him on a match day, it was, it was still just as good. Yeah. The second part of my question was when he did finally leave. Mm. So what, what did you... Did you change much? Uh, well, straight away when he... It, it was after the Colville game um, and he got the call. He rang me and said, you know, they've, they've asked me, you know, to go. Um, from that point, I was quite... I felt gutted really because I'd only been there a short time and enjoyed working with Andy, I enjoyed the group. So straight away you think, okay, what does that mean for me? Um, and I then got the call and asked to kind of, you know, take it until they, you know, found, you know, what they want to do basically. Did that call come pretty much straight away, did it? Yeah, so it was I think they just needed um, confirmation that they'd still have something stabilising yeah. and how the fixtures fell. There was no league game then for a week and a half. So the only game that I had to take was Corby in the Elia Cup and then a training session and then they were going to review it after that. So yeah. I said to Andy, you know, I'm because of where I live, location is great, club for me is great. Um, I didn't, I, th- I could have gone with Andy, but he wasn't going to go anywhere else. Mm-hmm. So I kind of said, look, you know, if I stay, you know, I, I don't want to look like I'm... Um, you know, stepping on toes or, or stitching you up. You he said you take that one. Yeah, I mean, Andy's a great guy. You know, we I get on really well with him. And he said, no, I think you know, just stay and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, which I did. Still in contact with Andy now. Um, and you know, from that point, it was kind of like, right, let's get Corby out of the way. And mm-hmm. it, that was for me. It was just went two nil down in the game. We won yeah, four we two. Were there, but we were there, yeah, game. we were at that but game, weren't we? Yeah. It, it was kind of. It, I had nothing to lose you know I was just stepping in it's a free hit wasn't it really yeah, yeah, yeah. Just so in. one thing I know we spoke off Mark after that game mm-hmm. um, I'll cut this out if you don't want it but no, <laughs> uh, no we asked you after that game um, obviously after winning would you want the job full time and you sort of said no um, as more experienced people that allowed yeah, it changed. Yeah, yeah no true so you know that that was the truth at the time um, and that is still the truth as far as there's more experienced people you know that have been at that level mm-hmm. you know, to manage it so I didn't want to uh, falsely put my name forward at that point because I was just doing the job that I've been asked to do step in uh, as the kind of few days after that materialized we had a training session uh, nothing was agreed as far as um, when a new management team would come in mm-hmm. during that period between the Corby game and the Tuesday after which was Michelover at home Mm -hmm. the management committee decided that um, they were going to you know ask for excuse me ask for applicants Um, and the date of uh, the deadline date would have been after Michelover game so we took the Thursday training session we had Saturday off just for for people to rest and let's see what's happening Um, then the call came and kind of said would you do Michelover uh, home and at the time they were obviously sitting top of the table. We are where we are, but again, it's not a free hit. Though, yeah, really. I'm interim. It's it's free hit. Um, no problem. Again, I really liked the group. I thought the group were great. Trained well. Um, got the win against Corby. So okay, let's let's see what happens. Um, so no problem with with doing that as as far as an interim basis. So absolutely no pressure. No pressure on the lads either. And that was. Um, explained before the game you know this, like you say it's a free hit um, that's the best bit about coaching as an interim isn't it yeah. that every 
every result there, if you get a win, the crowd are happy. Yeah. If you get a loss, they don't really mind much because yeah. you're the interim no, at that absolutely. point. Absolutely, and, and that's probably the same in, in any walk of life. You know, as a player, if, if you feel no pressure, hmm. you literally have no weight on your shoulder. You can just go and express yourself freely. Yeah. And it, it was an easy team talk, really. We, you know, we had a game plan, um, and the lads executed it really well. But it was an easy team talk because you felt actually, I've got nothing to lose, so I'm not going to show any pressure. Mm. You, you're not going to feel any pressure from me, and and the game kind of worked out positive in that respect. And obviously, to beat them um, when we did, and again the elation, the fans. I'm not lying when I say I probably had about 100 messages on my phone after from people I didn't know that had found me on social media saying thank you, best performance of the season, etc, etc, from all Kettering fans. So from that point... I'm sure we didn't get a few messages about how expensive that game was. Because <laughs> <laughs> we got a few messages oh, about really? how expensive that game yeah, was. Yeah. The Corby game, yeah. Yes, yeah. oh, the Corby game. Mm. So f following that result against Mikelova, I then felt, right, my stock's gone up a little bit here because all of a sudden they're receiving applicants, but we've just beat Mikla over at, at home, who were top. It's hard to ignore you at that point, yeah, isn't it? does that make them think, all of a sudden, we don't need to get anyone else in, everything's within. Hmm. And as a club, they would have been thinking, we get new management, that might cost us more money, that means complete change of playing staff, etc., etc. So, <laughs> the, the question then was to me from the club, you know, will you be throwing your name in the hat? And I was like, I've not even thought about it. And from that moment, it was, okay, so do I seriously want to do this? Mm -hmm. Is it the right thing for me? Is it the right thing for the players? Is mm -hmm. it the right thing for the club? Yeah. Um, then we had some conversations, obviously, if I was going to do it, I'd need support, yeah. you know, whether it be from the club, players, uh, or within. So um, players were positive with what they said and, and kind of, we're saying why? why Did you have the backing you? of yeah, the majority yeah, of the dressing room? Yeah. Yeah. So the players like, why wouldn't you do it? Because mm -hmm. like, you've won two games, etc. Yeah. Um, Kelvin Langmead, who is kind of thirty-eight, coming to the end of his playing career, although he's still playing. He got a, a Southern League medal, not yeah, sorry, didn't yeah, he? Yeah. No. He's, he, you know, he won the league, I think, with uh, with Banbury. Mm. Um, and he's, you know, he's ex-pro, and he kind of said, look. You know, I'm gonna not gonna be playing forever. If you want to be involved, then I'll support you and, and be part of that. Um, obviously, from having relationship with Kettering beforehand, there was people that I'd already spoke to. Got some very good coaches in the, in the 18s, haven't they? Like yeah, Frankie absolutely. Fry and yeah. the ex-league so player Matt Heath. So yeah, Frankie yeah, so he is in team now, yeah, 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 so Frankie's joined us as well. He, he, you know, and and in the end, it was kind of like, okay, we could do this, and this would be the management team. This would be mm -hmm. the setup. We brought in Sean Allen as goalkeeper coach, who was with Paul Cox before at Kettering. Mm -hmm. He was a Kettering man, um, and actually, okay, I'm not ready to go. If this is going to be the only option to currently stay, then let's put our name to it and, and let's mm -hmm. let's let the club decide. So, obviously, we beat Mikelova. We wanted to see how training went Thursday to get a feel as a potential new management team how that would go. And um, you know, we we kind of felt all right. This this went well. Um, we had Alf Church on that Saturday, mm -hmm. um, and the decisions were going to be made on the Sunday. So. We got the point away at Alf Church, and then the, the decision was made. So that's how we that's how we got in, and we, we felt you know confident. We feel like there's a really good, uh, good group of players, and uh, you know if if we didn't feel that, if we didn't feel there was good enough players or belief, then we, we probably wouldn't have done. It. No, um, obviously. So since you have been appointed, uh, mm. a lot of players have come and gone. Yeah. Um, one of them being obviously our former guest, Will Mellers Blair. He's got big ambitions for himself. Yeah. Um, how do you rate him as a player? Is he, are them ambitions backed, backed up? Yeah, I think, first of all, with Will, forget about the kind of player he is to start with. As a person, absolutely brilliant. You know, and I think, for me, first and foremost, you need the right people in the change room. And he's one that you want around. So, number one, you know, as far as that's concerned, you want him around. Number two, he obviously found it difficult to get a lot of game time before yeah. me. Um, and then during that period, the games that we played, he scored against Corby. I think he scored two goals against yeah. Corby. And then the, the system that we were going to play then potentially didn't benefit him. And I don't want people to be dragged along 
on the bench if they need to be playing or have aspirations to, to move on. Um, me and Will have a great relationship and still still talk now. He, he you know, sent me a, a Christmas or a New Year message. Nice. And real real top guy and I want the best for him. And I think a brace on his debut, I think, for Henderson. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, he did. And I rang him that night straight after knowing, like, we'd won away at Howe's Owen, but I saw he scored two, picked up the phone straight away just to congratulate You know, real top guy. Hmm. So it wasn't about his ability, it was just about with regards to the shape and the way we play, I felt that it would be more difficult for him to get minutes. Therefore, you know, to get him game time elsewhere was, was perfect for him. So here's the other controversial release. Well, not really controversial, but one of the bigger names, mm. Leon Clark. What yeah, happened? so Leon Clark. He was obviously um, coaching a kid at Minster, wasn't he? Yes. As well yeah. as playing. Yeah, so he's still doing that. He was doing stuff at Wolves Academy as well. He's obviously, you know, 38. He's going to finish playing in April. Um, I thought he was excellent in the two games that I did as interim, which was Corby and Mickelover. Made a nuisance of him. Yeah, I think Corby, didn't he? Yeah, I, th I think he, he was he was what we needed. We just needed someone to be a little bit of a battering ram, and obviously he's got quality and experience, which is ideal. Um, the honest answer is we wanted to keep him. Mm -hmm. uh, Mickelover put in a seven day after we played them. Um, that's the worst. You won't understand this, George. Yeah. Like a seven day is like the thorn in the side, yeah, yeah. the biggest kick in the teeth on the box ever. Yeah, and yeah. a seven day. So to be fair, Andy had um, got him in for for relatively cheap at the time, with the thought of um, improving that and extending the estate catching. I wanted him to stay. We got to that improvement that he felt was justified. However, Mikelova beat that, and he wants to earn as much money within the non-league game as he possibly can. Of course, I can't, I can't take that away from him. I felt he was great for the group. The lads really liked him. I really liked him. Unfortunately, that last football, and we had to, you know, see him go. Well, in regards to incomings, mm. you've re-signed George Forsyth. Mm. Good signing. Yeah, Forsyth is good. I mean, I, obviously, I've not worked with him before, but he's highly regarded. Within, within the club Frankie Fry who was part of club's um, management team last year knows him quite well um, he played with Langers I think at Kidderminster when he was when he was younger um, and obviously some of the players from last year that are still there will know of him he just knows the club he's a little bit more experienced um, was it an initial one month loan isn't yeah it? it'll be one month loan initially uh, and we'll just see how that goes I think it'll be dictated to by Telford to be honest yeah. um, but but having someone like that who knows the club and knows what's needed, I think is important. And it happens to be in a position that we probably lack a bit of experience with. 100%. Yeah. Oh, that one was uh, loved a lot on Lon, wasn't it, as well, by the fans. Yeah. See a load of Ketchum fans commenting yeah. on that. Yeah. A bit of a cool hero for them. Yeah. To, to be fair, Ketchum fans as well are um, very open and honest. So That's one way of putting if, it. If, you, if, you've if, been on the radio yeah. too long. So, so, so if it is something negative, they'll let you know. Mm. But, yeah, thankfully it, it was positive. Uh, another player there that uh, we sort of know of, Neo Dobson, mm. coming from the Cobblers. Yeah. Um, yeah, Neo's. Um, so Kelvin Langmead is part of Northampton Academy. <clears throat> so he helps coaching there. So that was the initial link. Again, we felt that we needed um, a bit of spice up top. Leon Clark went. <clears throat> left the position open obviously Will went who could play at front as well so left an, an opportunity open for someone young and hungry like Neo to, to come and have a look we, we started him his first game away at Hales Owen um, and then he's not had too many minutes since then he's training with us trains with Cobbler's first team as well and they rate him highly so you know he's he's here to um, you know learn learn a bit of step three football as opposed to you know professional league one so again he's got plenty of years in front of him but um, you know so Cobblers far have for a someone, few out on loan haven't they yeah yeah I mean it's, it's key at that age hmm. to get those guys out and, and get them different football because you can be a great footballer in, in football league but some of those players do struggle at, don't quite you know, transfer so well it might be it? unpredictable it might be hmm. more physical it, you know it might be more demanding um, so yeah I think it'll be key key for Neo and hopefully we'll see more of him do you, can you see him staying at the Cobblers in the future and having a good career there? I think so. I think um, John Brady, historically, because he was part of the youth before, he was always um, you know, encouraging the youth to try and get through. And, and mm -hmm. likewise, they'll still look look to do that. Maybe 
cobblers at the moment are slightly different whereas they would have been league two before they're now league one and they're doing well so flying you know, at the minute youth they? might mm. take more of a back seat or the chances might be a little bit more restricted mm. I think it's really important for the development whatever club it is to try and get out and, and get minutes and see how the uh, see how they go nice another one coming Phoenix Schultz it's great name like that yeah, <laughs> he's a great <laughs> yeah he's a real good guy he um, must be a really good footballer for a name like that I bet you <laughs> I guarantee it he wears gloves I guarantee it I've not seen that actually. No, it's no. got to be with a jazzy no. name like that. Yeah, I've, I've seen some Under Armour, I think, at training. But again, you know, real good guy. He's had um, EFL trophy experience with Mill Keynes. Um, they rate him. He's he's uh, he went on the, I think their their first team um, pre season in maybe it might be Scotland, I think. So that kept him involved and again mm. he's an, he's another lad that needs to you know learn senior football um, he's got a bit of that with Milton Keynes and obviously you know he's, he's experiencing that with us as well and it's not just games where he's training it's the social environment with I think that's men. a big thing for me the social yeah, environment yeah. within that area is, yeah. is majorly different isn't yeah. it, compared to an academy like academy football is two different things yeah. completely yeah and I think you know you, you get the, the change room antics you'll get some of the you know ex-pros or you'll get you know some of the the senior players at that level that will help and develop them. You know socially, you'll get players at similar ages that maybe aren't quite as good, but they'll teach them the rough and readiness. You know and, and, and physicalities. So um, again, he's got the right. You know those guys have got the right attitude. Yeah, it's really then down to them. But um, you know so far, Phoenix and, and Leo have been good. Yeah. Are we going for the big one now? What's that? The last one on this list. Go on, you know him, do you? Bruno Andrade. Yeah, I do, so, yeah. From um, Chesham. Yeah, he was at Chesham. So when I came in with Andy, actually did a bit of research beforehand about okay, if Andy wants me in, you know, how am I going to contribute? So um, I know Bruno was during COVID he'd probably like had a bit of taste. I think Boron Wood main head, but before that, he'd obviously Salford, Lincoln, Stevenage, QPR. So okay, you know, if we want a bit of quality and and a bit of experience within the league he's, he's 30 so he's not over the hill you know he's, he's, he's not too young so um, again good guy got him in unfortunately he played in, in his first game away at St Ives when we got hammered and uh, Boxing Day so you know we've not really seen seen him but very very good player though. yeah he, he'll, he'll be good I think he, you know I think again you know like we said before it doesn't always mean that someone that's played higher is going to completely f- flourish He's been playing at Chesham recently because mm-hmm. one of his good friends has been there, their top um, of their division, and um, you know hopefully he can he can improve us massively going forward. Nice. Um, I, I don't know if you want to touch on it. I know you just mentioned that game there, mm. St Ives. Yeah. Um, I read an article today on the Telegraph. Um, He's lying. There was no pictures you can't read. <laughs> and uh, pop up it. Was. You Correct. seem to um, <laughs> yeah, <that's> it, yeah. <laughs> obviously. The score line, score line mm. says it. Obviously, you're very unhappy with it. Um, some of the quotes I took from it seems yeah. you're very unhappy with the lads there. Yeah, it was honestly, it was um, probably have to be careful what I say because I need to be professional. But it, it was, it was embarrassing. Yeah, it was embarrassing. But I, I, there's a bigger, there's a bigger thing to it. I think the group of players aren't used to winning. Mm. Their mentality is when they do win, it's kind of like, oh, thank God for that that's kind of job done and it just felt that we felt winning away at Hales Owen was good enough it was good enough for them it wasn't good enough for when we turned up at St Ives you know that's a mm. brand new start that's a reset that's a work hard we you know, it, the fans that were there would have been appalled I was appalled and trust me you know I, I look at every performance not just as a manager but also as a fan because they're paying money they, they need value for money of course yeah and if if the club are paying these players to perform you know everything has got to give value and if they're not giving value um, it's it's obviously deeply disappointing and uh, did you give them the Fergie treatment when you got them in the dressing room uh, pe- people that have worked under me will probably sometimes say they might be that I'm too nice they might say that but there's sometimes where I won't be at all. So I'll Isn't that the scariest part though? If a manager for me, <coughs> from when I played a little bit, if a manager for me was too nice, the one time yeah. he did lose his shit, yeah. I would have run. Because yeah. that means he's definitely lost his head and yeah. you need to move out of the way because he's yeah. about to go blow. There's, there's always a time and a place. And I think, first of all, the question is, or 
the, the statement is you need to get the best out of your players at all times mm -hmm. if if you're being nice and you're being methodical and you're being tactical and they're getting it then great mm -hmm. and if you if you perform to your optimum levels with that and still lose I can accept that yeah but when it's pretty much like a Sunday morning wander around the pitch at step three mm -hmm. that's how it felt from me so yeah I mean you know what stays in the dressing room stays in but yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't pretty and I think it was just a massive learning curve for me Lannes and Frankie to say okay we are we are not always consistently at the moment going to be the team that beat Mikel over at home mm -hmm. or Hale's own away mm -hmm. you know so we've got to try and keep hold of those performances and try and make that consistent it, for me it's psychological because there's good enough players in there um, but yeah if they perform like that again then you know it'll either be released you know or it'll be you're going to be running for four weeks until you fit yeah so you just said obviously the players in there can do it mm. the quote I took there was um, there's not enough players in there that believe we're ready to fight mm. do you so obviously then you said you're going to make your players run seeing them running at training now yeah, do I you think believe that they're, they're going to back, back that up we, we, they did run um, however they could call it a punishment if they wanted and they can take that as that because probably every fan at that game watching that would have wanted them to to be running to the ground but actually I've looked at it as a this is for your benefit character building exercise character building mm -hmm. if we are in control of giving you every tools in the box to perform mm -hmm. we don't think you're fit enough so this is why we're going to do this this is going to try and benefit you so mm -hmm. do it put it in because ultimately at that level with all due respect to Ketrin yeah <clears throat> all of those players are looking to move up because yeah. that's the, the short yeah. career span of a footballer yeah. you're helping them to try and get to that level they've got yeah. to perform for you at this level to get to that yeah. level yeah. that's the least you can expect absolutely, from them absolutely Sam yeah I think if you if you want to play higher then you benefit catching before you do correct you know, and we will help you to develop and move on if mm. that's what you want to do if you're just going to toss it off you know in the words of, uh, of you know what you were saying earlier then why should we back you why should fans appreciate and accept 100%. that you know and we're not going to accept that and they know that you know they're, they're not stupid either you know i think i'm hoping that it was just a, a one-off you know draw a line under it forget about it mm -hmm. but the learnings that we're taking from it is that there wasn't enough on that day there wasn't enough trust there wasn't enough work ethic and you know we need a bit more experience that are going to ensure that that doesn't happen again mm -hmm. um Obviously, it sounds like a stupid question, but you said, "Look, if you lads don't want a beer, mm. walk away." Yeah. Has anyone? I assume everyone's got behind you now and backing and got the same sort of mentality as you. Look, yeah. we've got to back this up. I, th I think right. you've got to be some brave lad to stick your head above that pool yeah. and say it's not for me, ain't you? Well, that's happened before at like low levels where I've been, and players have been like, "Do you know what? You're right. I'm not good enough. I want to go." You're right. You're absolutely right. So again, it was a test of honesty character etc etc so if you're telling me you're all in then now you two weeks in. later you can't come back, yeah. back to me and say yeah. well i can't Absolutely, do yeah. you've already told me so, you're all so in. now you're all in so whatever we do now to get you better to improve the club you can't you, whinge about yeah you can't whinge mm -hmm. you're all in whether you're a sub left out starting mm -hmm. you're going to give every bit of inch for catching town whilst you're here you have the opportunity to leave and say they didn't want to be here you didn't take that, so you give your all now. I get that. Obviously, no one's going to stand there and go, "No, I don't want to be here." That's no, not. That's no, not, Jordan, they would. That's the difference, mate. I reckon. Yeah, hundred percent. But there I mean, are footballers that would do that, and like as Jim said, the lower down the leagues you go, the more bollocks a player's got. Yeah. A player will stand up and say, "I'm not good at this level," or "I'm better than this level." That you you'll get players mm -hmm. doing that. It, it does happen, yeah, doesn't yeah. it? It was. I mean, I would have. If somebody was in that mindset they want to go, I would have loved them to be open and honest about it and then we could have a conversation. I could have said, yeah, I agree with you or actually I don't think you're quite ready. It would have been a good test of where they thought they were and mm. it would have engaged that conversation. So it, it was almost like a, a bit of guided discovery, right? How, you know, who thinks that they're not up to it? Mm. If you're telling me now you're all up to it, then absolutely fine. Because if, you if you're all buying in, perfect. I haven't got to worry anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, Obviously, no one's going to say that. I, I, I wouldn't think that, but I mean, if you I assume everyone in training is giving it everything, no, yeah. no one's dragging their heels in training no, anymore. No, absolutely. So that that session um, afterwards was was tough, um, and 
they've, they've openly admitted that they've not done too much fitness work because there's different methods from coaches and, and managers where some people might believe that you want to work hard just with the ball. And that's some methods, but you know I'm also a believer of you ain't always got the football. You need to be able to run. You need to cover shape. You know everything is is drilled into what a Saturday or a Tuesday night match day is. Um, if you count how many times as a player you've got the football, you know it'll be a lot less than when you haven't. Right, so, isn't it? Yeah, so you, you you've got to cover a lot of ground, and um, if you can't beat teams or you're not better than them with the football, you need to be better than them with fitness and strength. So, mm. obviously, you said a minute ago there that catching fans are open. Did you get much stick off the of fans after that game? Um, at the moment, so far, I think uh, personally, I've not been getting anything from them. But there was one or two players that that got it and some of it might have been personal abuse which is yeah. a little bit yeah, yeah. difficult to take for players but like we said after you know these these are the people that pay the money these are the people that might have had a beer watching the game these are the people that care a lot mm. about the club and it's their club it's not our club you are just a custodian I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah you know I'm guardian a part of the you know guardians looking after it the the players are there they're not going to be there forever the fans are going to be there supporting catching forever mm. so if you perform like that, unfortunately, you're gonna to have to sometimes take that and be professional enough to not buy. That's just how it is. Do you use that as a bit of a team tour? Obviously, next game then it's a tough game. Needham Market second in the league. I think the team talk against Needham is um, if you don't perform, I'll feed you to the walls of the fans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah I, said, I said that Sunday league level, mate. If there's no fans. I'll feed you to this like over. Yeah. I'll feed you to. I've always walking around. <laughs> <laughs> Was it, and, and again, I, I can sympathise with the fans because I'm a football fan myself. I'm a Tottenham fan, so I'm used to. Actually, don't like football. Then. No, yeah, I'm used to lose. I'm used to roller coaster. Didn't say that before we got him on the show. <laughs> no, Wouldn't yeah. have got him on. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think, and the players, they'll all support a team. They'll be involved, so they'll, they'll realise, they'll understand. And look, we know in football as well. You, you know, you can't, you won't always win. If you show a lack of heart and lack of desire, then you deserve some pelters, you know, because that's all the club want. The, the fans, the club, management, you know, the, the players that care will just want to see a hard working performance. And if that's good enough to get over the line for three points, great. If it if it means a, a draw, great. If it's if it's a loss, then have we done enough in that game and we just didn't get the, the rub of the green? That's fine to an extent, but if you don't show anything, then you deserve what you get. Yeah. So you said you're too nice. Somebody, I imagine, but correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not a nice person in a sense when things are not do they're not doing their job properly. Yeah. Is Gary Stork? Yeah. So I, I, mean, feel, I feel he was <coughs> as a captain. If I was playing underneath him, yeah. I'd be petrified to do something wrong in a positive way, yeah. as in not perform, because yeah. I wouldn't want him down my neck giving me grief for not performing, like not running my bollocks off. Basically. Yeah. I think because um, he is one of those guys that will run yeah. and run and run and give two hundred percent for catcher in town. Yeah. He's, and he's, he's a leader. Leeds fan, so he's a, <laughs> yeah. That's why it sounds fair. Yeah. 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 He's, he's a leader by example. He come and watch one of my games on a Sunday, did he? Yeah. He's a leader by example. Um, yeah, he, I mean, we've missed him. So he's, he's been out injured for quite a while. His his first start back was Hales own away. The next game, I think, was Redditch at home actually, hmm. which he got injured in after four minutes, and it's a knee problem which could be four or five weeks. So actually, Gary's only played kind of ninety four minutes um, so far. He set up the goal, the goal against Hales own. So as a captain. He probably feels a little bit more backseat at the moment because he's not playing mm. um, due to injury. So, yeah, I mean, Gaz is a great guy, really good captain. Um, you know, Hart is, is Kettering. And, um, yeah, you're right, him and along with others, <clears throat> if it's not going well, you know, there'll be a few things to say. To be, on, to be Can honest... Can you imagine though, us like, getting shouted at by him <laughs> and Kelvin <laughs> Magnum? Can you imagine? To, both of them to together shouting at though, Sam, I would say that he probably hasn't felt like doing that a lot because some of the performances have, have been okay hmm. the St Ives one was just completely I bet you didn't have to go, go mad because he did instead yeah everyone knew, you know it was a very quiet dressing room if I'm honest until I started shouting so. there's one player up place for St Ives I wanted to ask you about hmm. Greg Casaboni how did he get on is he still going he, he, St Ives I, I don't think he played against us oh, actually you know, he was on the team sheet I've seen today oh was he yeah he must be getting on a bit now surely he might is he? 31, yeah. Yeah, I, I saw that he played against Stamford. Um, 
but uh, I mean St Ives anyway were brilliant going forward yeah. against us I mean, really patch and play at St Ives for a bit did they? I think so during Covid uh, we, we, we made them look better hmm. because we were so poor however you know on the day they could have probably won 10, 11, 12 now because the three going forward were, were lightning and obviously I remember Casaboni was at Diamonds before and you know they're, they're just very good going forward Johnny Edwards also um, was up top and um, and Brandon uh, in Joker I think it is he got his debut for Cambridge at the weekend so he was in the St Ives starting 11 then so he's at Cambridge so they, they've got some they've got some good lads and, and to be honest Ricky's done a great job at St Ives he's been there all the time um, and uh, you know for, for what he has as far as resource he, he's done excellent yeah no, fair play. Uh, we played, I think it was on Sunday with them when we were kids. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, remember a, I remember him as a ball boy at the Congress meetings. Can you just, can you just but, see him going down? No, well, I believe it or not, I used to be quite quick as well. Oh, okay. So <laughs> you you me and him at front, yeah. It was a good race between me and Graphic, you're putting your yeah, down yeah, with yeah, him now. Yeah, yeah. slowing me down, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, no, we're going to move on from Ketra now and have a little chat about your career. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've been around around the town, haven't you? Yeah, yeah you say I'm old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it all started at Ketra anyway, didn't it? Um, yeah, new so career there. Um, <clears throat> I got very early stages. I was at Villa as a lad for about three or four seasons. Um, then went to Northampton for a couple of seasons then went to Diamonds for a season then ended up catching about 16, 17 so I was there for three or four seasons so as a lot of the um, government run courses now it was pay scheme at, at that time so we train um, full time and have education as well very so, similar to the current future lines yeah, yeah yeah, similar to that so um, that's how it all started Don Genovese um, God rest his soul was, was our manager and we had quite a, a, a good group of young players um, and during that kind of three year period, um, a few of us then got tastes in the Hillier Cup um, and um, and then towards the latter end was, was more kind of just involved with the first team, travelling on the cove and then go to Northwich and putting the kit out and, and stuff like that and just being involved in and around it. So Any of the boys that times. were with you there gone on to do anything um, notable? So if I think of names uh, that were there, so in goal we was ordinarily had uh, Willie Gawley so he was playing he did play first team, a couple of first team games I think and then went to Corby hmm. um, and then isn't playing anymore Mikey Bullchong got first team appearances Chris Defanti got first team appearances there's a lad called Michael McKenzie um, he was Milne Keynes lad I remember him getting a contract out of everyone he was a lot younger but he came on and um, got a contract from a, a performance there so there was a few that that you know went on to um, you know to play play games with, with catching but also then had good UCL careers and, yeah. and, and what have you so going back then obviously before that you touched on Villa what was the Villa setup like? yeah Villa was great I mean I was a nine year old oh, so right. it was I was spotted playing my first game it was for Wellingborough Grammarians I remember it was at Croydon Park we lost 10-1 to Grange United I think and I scored the one and I had a knock on the door on the Tuesday um, to say would you want to come to train and I said my dad answered and from then I, I kind of got into uh, the, the centre of excellence there for, isn't it mad how things three. change because I'm a scout at a club yeah. if I'd gone and knocked on your door now <laughs> yeah. I would yeah. be in so much trouble it's unbelievable I, I could imagine 30 odd years ago there wasn't email being used or, or well, yeah. text messages yeah. like that. So, um, but that's how it was and um, started started training there um, Monday nights I think it was uh, initially at Market Harbour and how it worked you had Bodymore Heath in Birmingham the, the Villa training ground was like the cent centre the main centre I think they had one in Telford one somewhere else and then one in Market Harbour and then once so often we'd all congregate on a Saturday morning to Bollymore Heath and have a session there the first team would be eating their pre-match meals there and, and it was kind of you, you got there and you thought oh this is professional you had all like your little lunch sorted and from then it was instilled in you okay if I want to be a footballer then I need to do this I need to do that and even at an early age it was okay you know this is what I've got to do and, and you know for three years it was great the coaching I had there was the best coaching that I'd, that I'd had, you know, through through my career, and, and that kind of helped me in those early stages, and, and gave me really a feel of, oh, I want to be a footballer. It's, it's intriguing to hear that because mm. I'm an academy coach yeah. as well, and it's 
in my head I'm thinking is that the way the kids see the stuff that I'm doing yeah. at Diamonds at the minute and then it makes me think how I could probably change things a little bit because yeah. I'm not thinking of it from a kid's point of view yeah, yeah. and I kind of forget that a little bit that you because obviously your lad played at Leicester quite recently he didn't did, it? Yeah, yeah. and you were wowed that he oh, was playing yeah, at Leicester like, let alone yeah. him so yeah <laughs> that, that was, even, like, for me I've never yeah. been around the academies yeah. and that, so for me to go up to Leicester Trains ground to see it and watch my boy play there yeah. like for someone who's not been around the academy yeah, exactly. I was like right, I love it yeah I can imagine it was well he texted me with a big picture look we're at Leicester we're at Leicester <laughs> <laughs> and I think, like, f if a if a kid is feeling that much excitement towards it, <clears throat> some kids aren't lucky that they don't have that family backing, don't have that parent that can run them around all the time, or they don't have that belief, or they don't have someone who's. Uh, my dad was critical, but in a constructive way. Didn't get a rollick in or I, I wasn't told I was the best thing since I sliced bread. It was kind of like, right, keep your head down, keep knuckling down, don't get carried away, just keep doing the, and, and that was really important. So I think that, in addition to the great coaching that I had, was, was just a nice feeling. I mm. didn't feel under pressure. I felt like actually this is where I belong, this is what I want to do. Oh, nice, I went my old man's everywhere. I reckon that's why my knees are bad, <laughs> getting kicked all the time. <laughs> um, no, so obviously, you, when you were at Ketra, then it was um, down to injury issues. Is that right? Yeah, so I had Osgood Slatters that a lot of younger kids have. I had that around the age of about 14. I was at Diamonds at the time, so I was out for a long time. And then moving to Ketra to do that um, pace scheme um, with everyday training, I picked up. I think in games or in training, I picked up knee ligaments, ankle ligaments, and in the end, it it kind of meant that I was missing games. I was at the age then where we'd start going out having a drink. I'd probably not eat as much. I was kind of thinking, oh, I've got to work now as well. I'm not going to be a footballer, and if I am, it's going to be non-league or semi-pro. So I guess with injuries, with you know the the um, the desire to drink alcohol and not really put you found the ladies it. gym didn't you well it's, it's, it's like beer and ladies or whatever <laughs> other, dis other distractions um, you then start to realise actually I'm becoming an adult what's priority now mm. and I didn't have that desire after I had so much desire and I sacrificed so much and so did you know my dad really for driving here there and everywhere you know on a, on a Sunday morning to premiership training grounds Villa versus whoever then as I got older, you kind of thought, I've missed out on a lot there. And I'm not, uh, I don't feel um, any regret, but I just felt at that moment in time that I thought, I'm ready to enjoy a bit of my life where I felt maybe looking back, oh, you know, I've, I've sacrificed a lot. And now I'm not gonna be necessarily a footballer. Can I still have a good life and enjoy it as well as play football? So I think as a parent of a footballing child, you often forget that. Yeah, that it's they're there to enjoy it, but yeah. then when it gets to sixteen and they're not going to make it and that stuff, yeah. they look back and think, "Well, I've just spent the last ten years." Yeah. For some kids, they five or six, they start. Yeah. They spent ten years playing football, week in, week out, training yeah. every single day, and all that business. It's yeah. not happened, and then they don't have a plan B. Yeah, I think uh, what I would say though is it if if I would you do the same all over again? Yeah, if if I ever had the chance to do it again, I would, but. All I would say is, and, and probably to like dads that are doing the same now, what you're doing, you're putting your kid into an excellent sporting environment where you can learn so many social skills, so many friends, put them into a sport that later on in life is still going to be great socially. It's keeping them away from any trouble that they might get distracted by, and for that, I'm you know massively you know thankful and, and you know really lucky that I had those experiences I didn't have any negativity going through maybe sometimes because of the environment it affected my schoolwork because then I wanted to go and play football I wanted to be Jack the Lad in the classroom and things like that so that's sometimes I can imagine a lot of parents would have to deal with with, with young kids within sport yeah. <laughs> um, that's just the environment that outside of school they're used to mm. um, but you know I, I feel that it, it stood me in massive good stead and yeah I wouldn't change it good when you left Ketron then, um, would you continue to play straight away or did you have a, a bit of time yeah, off? So or? I went uh, on loan initially to Corby. Um, Rob Dunyon was the manager at the time and I loved my time at Corby, loved it. I think at the time it was myself and Liam Carson who was at, at Ketron and so we went there as a, a double loan signing. And that was the first time then when I really was playing men's football. <clears throat> 
17, 18. And it was great environment. The lads were brilliant. You know, there were some old school Southern League players in there, but also those were playing on a Saturday and they would go out clubbing at night and stuff. And we kind of, it was, you know, that part of enjoying your life. It was like, oh, okay. So along with playing men's football as well, I've, I can still do this and I can still- And you've got your laugh. 40 quid in your pocket from <laughs> yeah, the Saturday play and then you can go out on yeah, the, the rather night like, before. Oh, I've got a bit of money I'm playing regular and I'll go and enjoy it socially so that was a really good time and then I was, I was probably there for two two and a half years um, League Lover came in as well so they took they took your option on the loan after yeah so well, following on from that it was kind of like well Ketchum I'm going to take you on Corby wanted me to stay I was happy to stay and enjoy my time mm-hmm. um, I think Dunny then either got sacked or he moved aside um, for League Lover so League Lover it was his first managerial job I think so he came in, it's quite weird actually, because obviously he was, you know, ex catcher manager now, and speak, still speak, but he uh, he came in as Corby manager, um, still had a, a, a great time, and, and just things then, as, as football does, it uh, materialised, then I think I picked up a couple of injuries, then I wasn't in the team, and I wanted to be playing, I was still young enough to try and, you know, play at that level um, as much as possible, so then from Corby, I transferred to Rothwell Town, who aren't about anymore, but again... I'm assuming that's the original... Yeah, is yeah, it? the bones, so mm. I think it's all houses now, but again, same level, really enjoyable time there at Rothwell, it was a younger side, but then it was... A drip always had like some um, Leicester lads. A, a, a young side, haven't they? Even now, they still yeah, have quite a young yeah, side. Yeah, well, that was Corinth. So Rothwell Corinthians, but Rothwell Town was a separate. So there were two teams in Rothwell okay, at the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Rothwell Corinthians in the UCL, Rothwell Town in the Southern League, um, and it was it was just a, a really good group of lads again. And it was again good socially. And I actually, at the time. Um, Lived, I moved to Rothwell with an ex-girlfriend, so I was actually living in the town. I was just walking up to play, and it was just ideal. Um, and I, you know, we, we had some really good times there. We had some. Um, we, we pushed for uh, promotion. I remember we had Nuneaton, who were big at the time, come and play at home in the FA Cup, and it was just again really good times. And then from Rothwell, then I was kind of um, things changed. So the squad changed. I wasn't enjoying it. Hmm. Um, and then I actually came here to Cookno, so with uh, Adam Sandy, who was manager at the time. That's where I kind of uh, played with Elliot Sandy and you know a few lads from Cookno that I still um, speak to now. Brian Page was a good friend of mine as well. He's, he's over in Scandinavia now, but it, and, and Cookno was a great crowd at that time. You know, mm. re- really, really good group of lads. Steve the, Digging there as well. Yeah, Steve, yeah. So Diggs came in um, almost. Mm just before I left. So I played a couple of times with Diggs, but then I left right, as okay. he um, uh, grew, you know, started his growth here. But ju- just a really great group of lads. The, the football almost became secondary to social because the football was just, it felt easy with mm. the group of players that we had. So we would be challenging. To be fair, it should know, be with those, yeah, those big names. Yeah, absolutely. Shouldn't it? We're challenging the top top six. I think the season before they'd, they'd won it. Um, so already there was a really positive energy. Um, but you know, the, the social side was absolute class. We'd be here till late playing poker and it, it, yeah, it, was, nice. just, it was just great, you know. And, so. Correct me if I'm wrong now, were you part of their FA Cup run? Yeah, so we um, I think we were we were a game we were a game or two um, before live T V. Yeah, so um, I got it. Third third qualifying round. Yeah, third qualifying. So the, the game I remember more so um, was the defeat at Chase Town. Which I scored in actually. So I remember. They're quite a big non league team, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they are, yeah. And we, it was, to be fair, it was here. It was a soaking wet Saturday afternoon. Windy as well. Like Windy it always is here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And um, I remember 92nd minute probably, Dave Maguire at the time, who was like a, a youth lad, but I think he was playing right back. He just boomed a ball, cleared it long. Um, the wind took it. it it kind of hit a sodden pitch and bounced over the keeper one all last minute. Brilliant, we're still in the FA Cup. Replay then was on Tuesday night away at Chase Town and <clears throat> we had a good side. You know, we had I think on the day actually Darren Collins was playing centre half. The ex cobblers player? Yeah. As in it wasn't like this big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's probably Dale Watkins who used to be with him at Ketchum, but yeah, yeah Daz was got so he played I think he was playing centre half. Um, it may have been me and Elliot Sandy up front. Um, 
Richard Bunting. I remember, to be fair, I remember Pagey sitting in the stand because he was injured, he was always injured. But we went there with a bit of belief and actually I think I remember myself, Stuart Smethers and Elliot Sandy scoring the three goals. Um, and we took them, you know, quite, I think we took them into extra time and then they, they scored late on and unfortunately we lost. And the other thing I remember about that was getting on the coach and then reversing into a tree. So we spent the journey <laughs> home freezing cold. Huh, nice. Yeah, with the window, with the but you know, it, great group of lads and then I think Chase Town obviously then then went on and um, is that the year they had their success yeah I'm pretty right? sure they were live on TV against um, well, someone that we shouting it now but yeah it was, we were unfortunate but we had a good cup going there does that make it even more bitter like if you would have beat them you would have been on telly like, like you, you can't um if you think about <laughs> what ifs and stuff, then you get annoyed. Yeah. You know what happened, what happened, and uh, yeah, we were unlucky, really. And, Such a uh, magic if the FA Cup. Though. I've only had a tiny little taste with like the under 18s FA Cup. Uh, okay, yeah, but it's, it's just nice. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, I won my yeah. first one. Yeah, and you know, you're just like, wow, this is. I'm in the FA Cup. Yeah, yeah. Like it's it's massive. Yeah. You don't feel no, like, right. until you're in it, and you look at the your team sheet, and it's got the little FA trophy <laughs> on it. And, like, and some the lads, you know, some of the lads will will take that as well. You know, some people might not ever play in the FA Cup again, whether it's youth or whatever. Um, you know they'll, they'll be able to say they're playing the FA Cup. We'll just call out one of our former guests here, Mitch Austin. Remember his deal he offered me, sold me on an album, bring me off for the last minute, on. and then I don't think you'll do that anymore with your Timber kid. <laughs> Did you say no? Or you I said I don't be up for it. But <laughs> yeah. I've not heard from him since. <laughs> Did you negotiate wages or anything? Like nah, I just want an <laughs> FA Cup appearance. <laughs> um, <laughs> might get one with Hackleton on a Sunday. Yeah, I mean, that's Sunday FA Cup. Yeah, yeah, nice. well, get you in. My plans on the coach and the way down. <laughs> I thought you were drinking the old way, kid. Yeah, that's, that's what you it. told oh, me. I've yeah. been no on a pitch with a few beers on the way down. <laughs> well, I've seen you without the beers, mate. You'll be, you'll be sound. <coughs> Probably be better with them if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I'll, so, doing my research here, I've got a gap here. So, you left Cook No 2005. I left Cook No and went to Heim Town. Right, so, okay. I played at Heim Town. So, Heim Town were. Obviously playing at Hyam, but they were the half of what is now Russian and Hyam United. So at the time, um, Hyam Town were bottom of UCL Div 1. Um, I had a few friends playing there and I just wanted to kind of come out of um, the Prem and just kind of play with mates. Which is what I did. I uh, played there for a, a few games and then all of a sudden the manager got sacked and they said, Jim, why don't you just take it for a bit? So I was like, oh, I can do. I'd always um, had an eye on coaching and managing. So when I was at Kettering, I did my, um, it was level one and level two. There was coaching certificate, I think it was called at the time. So I thought, oh, okay, yeah, I can maybe do this. So I started to bring in a few lads that I knew would play. Um, so I was 22, just turned 22 at the time. Um, and actually then we went from Bottom of the table, we were so far bottom. Went from bottom of the table, I think, and finished third from bottom that season. But if you look to the form guide, we'd be top six. So it was kind of like, okay, that we we had a good end to the season. And again, we just brought in a good social social culture. Hmm. And Pagey, who I knew from here, came across as my um, assistant manager because he was injured. He wasn't getting involved, um, but he was doing his coaching. So that was ideal. And those that know Pagey is all about social. So that environment was... <laughs> was Sounds was, like usual. You would have fit <laughs> in, <didn't laughs> it? Was, was making it. And oh, we yeah. were having kind of late nights in the club again and lock-ins hmm. and stuff. And it, it was just a great environment. So then the next season, actually, I'd enjoyed it so much without the level pressure I could just almost you know, we, we, it was a win-win we weren't going to be as bad as we were last year let's just say how it goes and, and as it happened we, we had a really good start of the season um, I was player manager because obviously I, I was young enough to still be relatively fit and uh, we, we got a good group together for that level and I think that season we finished sixth I think joined sixth um, but the club was in a, at a point where they used to play almost on a park pitch and it was a time where UCL then was thinking right you need this much concrete around Flood the pitch and, all, that, yeah, yeah, and yeah. all that so the idea was to okay we don't want this to fold or we don't want this group to fold what can we do you had Rushton Rangers that were playing at Hayden Road in Rushton and they were playing in the combination so they were playing a league below they weren't at the time good enough to, I guess to go up because they hadn't finished in promotion so the thought was actually can we amalgamate the two teams so still play 
you know, in the UCL and, and et cetera, et cetera. So from that, the rest is history. The, the two clubs got together and decided they'll give it a go. And, and that's really then how Russian Heim was formed. Heim Town went for a bit, but then I think it was reformed again and they play at Vinyl Drive um, still in, in um, it, actually Heim Town now play at Lancaster Fields, I think, and they've gone into the combination prem. Yeah. Um, but there was they started a team up there and obviously Russian Heim became live. So then I was manager of Russian Heim for their first full season as, as that club. Um, and then I, after that season, is then when I went to Rawns. Um, it, it just wasn't the club then wasn't right for me, and I just wanted to go somewhere. And had a few friends at Rawns, and and then I went and, and played at Rawns for a few seasons. So that's one of Sam's former teams. Yes. How did you find Rawns? Yeah, Rawns is um, it hasn't changed since I would have gone there the first time. You know, it's, it would have still been Leslie and Dave. It would have still been you know. <laughs> Leslie's lovely. Yeah, it still would have been Ronnie and, and the old. But you still getting the uh, chili con carne like after the games yeah, at that point. Still, still yeah, yeah, still better bar ain't changed, has it? <laughs> no, it hasn't. <laughs> exact, everything's exactly the same. And like Rawns has always been I think from the outside looked at uh, you know still like a seven league stature so when I when I joined there I said to Jordan I was like look I've just joined a sleeping giant yeah 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 and it it definitely is Um, there is um, history in there from when it was in the southern league so I think it costs the club a lot of money which they've been repaying back it's owned by the town if you like so there's not someone there that can just plunge money in and trying to make it grow but it's it it's there as a blank canvas almost for someone to go in and say look we want to we want to develop and improve this and I think it's a Kettering based coach that's there now at the current time yeah isn't it? yeah yeah so uh, is it Matt I think so but you've got like McBride and, and, and Luke there as well as joint managers haven't they I think uh, no there. I think Matt's still the, I think Matt's the manager now oh okay I believe so okay um, and, and so, so yeah he's the captain isn't he there McBride right okay yeah so I, I played there for a bit yeah and then I think I might have gone back to Russian Heim for a short while and then back to Rawns but I went back to Rawns then as, as a joint manager at around about I was about 30 I think with Scott Manning then so with joint managers how do you find joint management because I when I've been in situations like that I found it very difficult because I'm a very not independent I think it's the wrong word mm. strong character in my ideas and my idealisations yeah I think uh You've got to be. You've got to have different strengths. Like you can't have the same strength hmm. and the same weakness because hmm. you're going to clash with the strength, yeah. and you're not going to get those parts done that, that you're weak at. So, with Scott Manning, we we were friends. Um, Scott was um, very good at talking to people. He was in Rawns local. People knew him. He was well respected in Rawns, um, whereas I wasn't in Rawns. So mm. we had someone in Rawns, and then we had someone kind of a little bit outside with maybe a bigger catchment outside of Rawns, where you know he could get the good players in and around Rawns. I could get the good players just outside. Yeah, we could all come together, and all these lads knew each other. We had no budget. We just literally had some things don't change. No, no, exactly. But we we would have five grand at the end of every season in fines and we would be in Blackpool for three or four days or we would some things do change because <laughs> I think they just went to Magaluf or right. something like that in a summer yeah that's probably a lot but we we would literally live for that you know but we knew that as long as the lads had that to fall back on on a Saturday night they would love being part of you know that group and we, we built something there for I was there for five seasons as manager. Uh, Scott was there for two as manager, but then I think one season as player. But we had a really good tight tight knit, and because of the club like Rawns, where it's it's well supported by the locals that that go up every week. But you, you're not getting crowds of two, three, four hundred. They're relying on players' money beyond the bar, keeping it ticking, etc. The running of it. So players bought into that we got them into bar they you know bought into kind of presentation nights race nights etc and because it was about campus we we almost you know Le- leslie and dave did all the administration all the food all the like stuff that maybe we couldn't do as managers but that anything else it was almost like a free canvas for us as well so we could we could try and, and build a portfolio we, we got sponsors in we did a bit of work on the ground um 
the sub benches that are there are decent we organise them and, yeah, yeah, to be fair. We, we kind of we wanted it to become a, a football club again and after that period of time you know we, I think in the end we the first season I think it went 12th 9th 8th 6th and 4th I think so, so you can see the progression was getting there um, unfortunately I, I felt then that you know, because the question might be, why didn't you stay? Could you go on further? I think we got to a point where I felt we were holding some of the players back that could have gone on and been better and earned some money out of the game. Maybe they didn't want to, but I felt that you know we we'd done a lot of work, and maybe even if we went up, there wasn't that financial backing. We wouldn't have had a budget. That would have been difficult times, and actually, I felt that that club just needed to be where it was because they weren't ever going to be big enough. Hmm. To sustain being a prem, so it was a great, great time at Ryan's, if I'm honest. Just touching on the club, they obviously both said that he's like Sam says, sleeping giant. Mm -hmm. Why do you think no one's ever gone in and sort of made it anything bigger? Uh, so, I mean, Ryan's is not a small town, is it? It's quite big. I, I think there's guys of yeah. developments going on there as well. Yeah, I no, mean, you're it's right. only getting bigger. You're right. I, th I think there's there's more that meets the eye with regards to the finances. Because I think they're still paying for a lot of debt that they had in the Southern League. Right. I might be wrong, but at the time that was certainly a slight issue. Um, when people maybe wanted to come and develop that, because it's owned by the town, if you get someone external coming in to try and change something, there's a reluctance because yeah, yeah. he's not from around here. How long is this going to last? Is it going to be another... You know, yeah, that's no disrespect to Letty. I do get that vibe as yeah. well. That yeah, it, it's not, not that she's been there long enough to. Yeah, I need to look after this. Yeah, because if I give this to someone else to run, and then it's only two years, and then they need me again, what's the point? And she is the scariest chair lady in the world <laughs> in a positive way. <laughs> like more scary than long, but me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so many times have I made a comment and run away from this. Yeah. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so you, you can't argue with that. Rawns are what they are, hmm. and it's a great. Um, great stage for people to go and apply their trade at, at step six but it's not ever going to be a club where someone's going to pump money in and they're going to grow but you find that a lot in, in the UCL yeah. you know there's a lot of hard working volunteers that won't put money in why should they because what are you going to benefit from that at, at that level um, but you need to run the club in order to just you know give give younger players or give players memories of playing there and we certainly did I think at that period so you choose to leave, leave Rawns um, Desborough after that is that right? so after Rawns actually I had about a year and a half out completely right. <clears throat> um, it's first tough being out of football isn't it? Um, massively what do normal people do on a Saturday? yeah it's it's weird <laughs> you know I, I kind of woke up Saturday first of all for the first week or two I was like oh this is nice because I haven't got to worry about I'm not getting texts from lads that can't make it or whatever it may be that you know, as well. especially at UCL level obviously I don't really get that now on, on a Saturday morning but I, I would have used to so it's just that initially it was a nice feeling um, I said that I'd have probably a few weeks out and then I'd just dip in but actually I had a lot longer and then even when the new season started I had a few calls and you know, do you want to come in do, uh, you know do you want to come work with me do you want to be assistant do you want to be joint manager blah 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 but nothing really kind of whetted the appetite a bit and it was just nice I'll be honest it was nice not really what, what was the reason for stopping yeah, so I think Rawns would be at Rawns as we we alluded to there was a lack of committee members that's not derogatory towards the committee members are there because they did a great job and they, they worked really hard but when you've only got four or five there's only so much that they can do hmm. so I would run raffles I would do race nights I would, we got into guest speakers so we had a few guest speakers in I was organising all that so as well as managing the football team trying to recruit players coaching I was also doing that <clears throat> so after five years that's that's quite heavy so I thought look, it, it'd just be nice and probably fair on myself just to have a bit of time out which is what I did and, and that was the reason what I didn't realise then when I actually got back involved was wow I've been out for a year and a half and I don't know any players all the players that I used to have or know have stopped playing 
See, that's my yeah. concern of getting yeah. him back into it because obviously yeah. with the eighteens, the lads that I know at eighteen, luckily have got another ten years in football. Yeah. Yeah. So eventually, I'm sure I can yeah, ring Kelvin Kel Kel and say, Kel, look, yeah. you're coming to my club, lad. Yeah. And he probably would. Do you know what yeah. I'm saying? But having that yeah. year, it really does have that knock on effect. It was massive, it? Sam. I, I, I couldn't believe, like most of my lads, had just knocked football on the head or just played in the combination, mm-hmm. got fat. Lazy, change their lifestyle, whatever. It's not fair be. on Jordan. <laughs> I'm just yeah. thinking, why are you doing <laughs> <laughs> um, But, but that, that was the fact, and I was like, wow. So I had to restart again. Mm. Um, so that took a bit of time, but then I was only at Desborough for a short while, and then COVID hit. So once COVID hit, again, it was like time out of football. So then it was kind of a time where, right, I can get back up to speed with what's been happening for the last year and a half which I did but then when you're trying to get players to come over and recruit because mm. at the time it was a, it, Desborough was a they were at bottom or bottom one of the UCL Prem they needed recruitment they needed new players new mindsets etc etc so speaking to players during Covid why would they move clubs because they've not had the opportunity to be left out so it was like well I'll just wait and see what happens when, I, when we get back playing so when we went back um, we for the next season after Covid we had the same um, same group of players mm-hmm. so it was about right fresh start let's get you picked up it was evident still that they weren't good enough really to to be where we wanted to be so we had to work really hard with that group of players and almost I think get to a point where we were bottom four Covid then hit again like proper Covid it was like right all football now is it is going to be stopped mm-hmm. a tough time wasn't it that yeah so I've, I've not really I've been there two well one full season if you like two halves not really done a lot mm-hmm. um, but I'd got myself back in and, and, and educated again so that was good and getting the coaching um getting back on the grass coaching was, was a good feel and when COVID hit difficult times and, and to be fair then it was kind of like well I can't think about football can't control what's happening so I, I basically just went on like many people done like a big running spree get myself back to fitness and I was doing up to about 200 kilometers a month then um, over the period of COVID f- felt kind of rejuvenated fresh recharged and when football was back again really went hard and, and to be fair <clears throat> The way Desborough was, we we started really slow, <clears throat> um, and we we slowly recruited, slowly improved, and we had a great second half of the season. Um, finished ninth, which when you look back at the history of the last twenty seasons, I think they've finished in the the top ten five times. So historically, they've not always been in that that level, and, and to finish there where we didn't have that second half of the season was great. We had some really good lads, um, and. You know, we felt positive then leading into this season. Just going back there, touch, <laughs> sorry, you said about obviously your time off and then you got back in and then that COVID time off mm. again. Did you fear again then that you, you know, things, players are going to not come back, um, things yeah. are going to move on again? Pl- players are like cars. I look at them like cars. If you don't tick over over the winter <clears throat> and you come back expecting to go at 100 mile an hour, your performance is going to be poor you know you need to be ticked over so there was evidently players that hadn't done nothing during Covid the ideal scenario would have been for them to use this as an opportunity to get yourself more fit and more ready etc but because of the the level and because of the um, you know different jobs that they maybe do and using that as family time etc obviously some would have would have been uh, maybe lost loved ones it would have been a difficult time psychologically as well you know some people probably didn't need that period of time you know they, football was their outlet and they, they didn't have that so it was a difficult time for them so when people came back you were then some were very unfit some were psychologically damaged some mentally couldn't carry on because it was like I've, I've lasted so long without football now I don't feel like I can go back and have it and some had adapted their lives around not having it and, and it's that social it. aspects again social isn't it? so aspects. people could have got like yeah. I know with a lot with the kids coaching a lot of kids became a lot shyer yeah, yeah. and like gone back in their shells yeah. a lot and I presume yeah. that was the same immensely yeah it was it was definitely yeah. and it was the same and not just players you know probably volunteers committee members coaches it was just a, a difficult time so when we got them back we had to work hard for that and it probably took us a few months to, to get to a level where actually 
you know, now we're in a place where we can try and improve and develop. And I was enjoying the time there. And then, you know, th this season was more difficult because Desborough, I, I would say that Desborough's budget is probably the same as it was 10, 15 years ago. Okay. So, even where, with the um, the renaming of the ground, so it's it's Scott Goodwin's Academy. That's yeah, renamed, so it's, it? yeah, SG um, Pathway Academy. So it used to be the R in, so who used to sponsor it, which is um, a place in in Desborough. Then we had the academy up there as well, mm -hmm. um, and they had their home there. But still, that that wasn't going towards the budget. That was almost the running club. So you know, floodlights and utility bills for every club. They'll tell you that it's astronomical oh, so, we've been at Chen's where Eddie's like can you stop doing an interview boy so I can get them lights off yeah, yeah. how many times yeah, have you yeah, said yeah. that to us yeah, that's, that's the rough and ready you know kind of reality of, of what UCL and, and combination would be like any lights now are just turning them on is a travesty if you can train six till seven without using the lights everyone's happy you know so we we were Sounds like me in the new house. So we're in that position where... Not with the guy at Christmas lights you had, mate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're in that position where that was just to help the runnings of the club. But also, there, is, there wasn't the amalgamation of the youth at Desborough. So there is now. Neil Healy, the manager there, has got that together in the club and now working with the youth. And, you know, for us, it was important to have youth up there to try and create memories for them at Desborough Town. Mm -hmm. Else, all you are doing is just trying to... You're feel, turning the machine really yeah, there, aren't you? Yeah, you're just seeing your players are coming in and out all the time. So, you know, can we create some memories here? Can we get people involved at Desborough to realise that this is a football club and eventually you might want to play here and blah, blah, blah. Um, but the actual budget itself was, was still exactly the same. Now, what you find now is, you know, because of how football has evolved, there's a lot more money being thrown around in the UCL. So and back in the day, was that on a, a win... So I'm not sure if you know, Joe, but certain clubs either pay players, they pay certain players and not others, or they do like a win, draw and a loss. Yeah. So when I was there, do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that was, um, everyone was on a basic. Yeah. It would have, when I first came in, everyone was on exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, I changed that because I felt that some were worth it, some weren't, and we just needed to try and ensure that we had that that right balance between, mm -hmm. you know, yes, there's an experienced lads there that maybe have earned that and they give you that value. There's some other lads that are just there to pick up some money. That's not we, what we wanted to try. We wanted to try and build that, you know, team spirit and team morale, which is what I knew had worked at Rules. Yeah. Um, and with Desbury, it was slightly different because then, you know, you, you pull in players from, it's not just all mates. You know, at Rules, we had 16 mates all playing with each other, which, mm -hmm sounds disgusting as I say that but yeah we were playing for each other should I say but it's very similar to what it's like now at Royal <laughs> yeah. Fair, isn't yeah. It? <laughs> yeah yeah no for sure and I think at Desborough then it was kind of let's get a group of lads that are worth what the club can afford yeah that accept that that's what the club can afford mm -hmm. and that we know that they're not there for money yeah um, but as the teams in that division gr grew their budget and teams that probably didn't have budget in the in the past then had budget it was more difficult and because of the way we finished that season players then were offered much more money now some were offered much more money and stayed some were offered much more money and, and went so all of a sudden then as a club you then thought oh, I'm thinking then as a manager right we need to recruit which mm -hmm. we would do naturally anyway but what's it going to be like next year it's going to be the same. In my view, it's going to be exactly the same. Mm. However we finish, the budget's not changing. So the calibre of player will never change because of the budget you've got. Yeah, and, and do I... Desborough probably would be happy just to stay in the league. Mm. But it was, it was becoming more challenging because a lot more clubs had more money. So we were finding ourselves... Especially in that, that league. Yeah, starting lower and lower. Mm. And, you, you know, you had clubs like Racing Club Warwick. You had clubs like March Town. You had clubs like Daventry. You had clubs like Aylston, who... Some big old budgets there. Yeah, there's, there. some, there's some good budgets there. And, and some are massively sustainable. So, mm. you know, it's... Desbury don't have that. So I felt that, do I want to do this further forward and in two years time look back and I've not necessarily achieved anything apart from mediocrity or just staying in the bottom four challenge it I didn't want to be that so yeah. I felt 
And that, that wasn't me necessarily being selfish. It, if, if I'm not all in, that's not fair on the club. So I felt it was the right time then to, to kind of step away and, and let someone else who would thrive on the opportunity then, then to take it. And, and obviously that's then when, where it materialised from, from then the conversation with Andy and, and getting to where I am now. Obviously you were massively appreciated in the league, not just from your own club, but I'm, I'll say I found an article online there. On, I couldn't find who wrote it, but it was uh, one of the UCL pages. And this was, I think, when you stepped down from Desborough. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time in the league and everything you've done for the league and all the players there. Yeah. Um, oh, no chance. I would not want a message like that. That's a, that's a, a terrible message, George. <laughs> <laughs> if no, you're, if I mean, you're not hated yeah. by other teams, then you haven't done a good job. <laughs> yeah. Well, we I guarantee you like, this. Yeah. This is the way I'm going to sell it to you. Yeah. So, you're a Man United fan, yeah? You hate you don't Man City. Don't need to sell it to me. I know no, no, no. You hate Man City, yeah? <laughs> You hate Haaland yeah. because he's their best player. Yeah, and everybody from Man United hates him because he's their best player and you wanted to play for you. Yeah. That's what I think it should be like with managers. If you yeah. come away with that, no disrespect to yourself, yeah, yeah, no. liked as a person, Sam's jealous then you've not done your job. supposed to be, thank you Sam, but it'd be a fuck off his shit. <laughs> no, I like that because that means I'm in someone's head. When someone's saying, oh, well done for making the league so lovely, it's not the message I want. I think, it, and, and from that, it's evident that everyone's different. Everyone has their different styles. Everyone has different coaching styles, different management styles. Mm. Walk to life, you you know, everyone works differently. Um, and just the way I'm brought up, I feel that I want to be representing the club in a professional manner. Mm. I don't necessarily, unless it's justified, be derogatory to others unless I feel like it's justified. But at the same time, I want to be seen as hard working um, and respected by opponents. Because I, I think, you're right, Like, and this is where people might say that I'm too nice, right? People might say that, you know, because there's, there's good managers that will throw three fucks into people and that's the type of player that they want and they'll get the best out of it. The players that I want, people that are, you know, honest, realistic. If I can see that there's a bit of dishonesty there, then they're not for me. Mm. I just want some. So I'm more of a manager or coach where, look, this is, it's down to you. If you're going to listen and take on board that, great. And if it comes off, then I'll give you the praise. Mm. If it doesn't work, then it's either we're not right for each other or you know we don't lose we learn all the time so I'm appreciative of opponents I, I, I can respect the job that they do you know every yeah. manager has a different, oh, of different course, job yeah. every coach has a different job volunteers you know everything so I, I'm cut from that cloth where I'm probably like oh thanks very much for everything even if they've just beat us 3 or 4-0 I can accept losing because I feel like if I can't then it's going to be a long journey in football yeah. It's going to happen, you know. You just got to be able to learn from it and and react in the right way. And that's just me, you know. Mm. That's just me. And some players might think that that's too nice. Some man other managers might think that's too nice. Um, but that's the only way that I know, and that's the way that you know I'll be. But you're yeah. right. Other managers and things. But I will never ever bring myself to be derogatory to others. As well. Oh no, I totally agree with you yeah. in that sense. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I like. I personally like to be the Panama and village. You, you know yeah, what I'm saying? You I like love that. It. Yeah, which is absolutely fine as well. I've but, always been. But you might not like it that I don't give you that. What you want as well. Yeah. So if you want me to, you know, get confrontational when I don't, that mm. might frustrate you more than. Yeah. You're giving, you're giving away my secrets here, Jim. <laughs> so, so anyone that's playing against you, Sam, if they just blank you out and shut up, then you'll get more annoyed, I guess. Well, correct. Yeah. <laughs> correct. Yeah. But I'm very much on that basis. And I think we share the similar things that, mm. as managers, we like to take the attention away from the player. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. very much... I think that's why I'm very much the pantomime villain, because yeah. I'd rather them have a go at me yeah. than my 11 players yeah, on the pitch. Yeah, yeah. Now, 100%. As a, as a manager of any um, team, whether it be football or whatever... I think you're doing the right thing to deflect any negativity away because you want the best out of those lads as possible, so you mm -hmm. want it as positive as possible, unless they put in a performance that is completely Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, you know, I've got so much admiration for, for everyone that gives up their time, works hard, and, and all they're doing is trying to get the best out of people that work under them. So. Yeah, so I was saying when you left Des with that post, that uh, must have felt great. Obviously, seeing that you've done a great job over the years, um, that led you on to obviously bigger things there at Ketchum Town. Yeah. Um, 
obviously that game that we spoke about, um, how gutted are you that obviously the next game got called off shortly after performance that you just, just sort of gets this, put actually. it right, didn't you? you kind of, it's, it's twofold. You can look at it and go, uh, we need a game quick to eradicate what we've just seen. Um, but also it gave us to extra reflect. time to reflect, mm. to probably stamp a little bit more authority about you know what we need, what we want from them. Also, like we said, to, to help them to get to levels where we think they can perform better. So it was what it was, I can't control it. Um, so um, I'm all about controlling the controllables only. If, if I can't, then I'm not gonna worry about it. So obviously we, we spoke about the uh, need a market going there. After that, you've got Stalbridge, Stamford, Hitchin Town and Bromsgrove. Mm. Stamford's a tough place to go to, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, looking at that, they're, they're all tough and every game at that level um, is, is tough. And like I've experienced already before, consistency is, is what you need. And, you know, Stamford Grand Jury's doing a, a great job at Stamford after coming up from um, last season. Um, need a market are, are right up there. They're a really good side for the level. Um, and teams that are down there or that were down there are starting to pick up. So it's really important that we, we start to evolve and move with the times now. So it's going to be a big month. Yeah. Uh, do you sort of earmark games where you think, like, looking at that Bromsgrove game, obviously it plays above you. Is that a massive game? Obviously, that's a must win. The other games, which All you're not really. Games, haven't they? I know, but like you say, in second place, you're not expected to win that game, for for example. Mm. Um, in, in football, it's. You can get sucked in by looking at the table, but as we all know, you know. Um, Jordan, don't look at the table, do you? Not, not, <laughs> not anymore. You not know, you're not a, but terrible. Like, again, I've been a Tottenham fan and I've gone. To White Hart Lane and thought, well, we can beat Wolves here, we can beat Wigan here, we can beat whoever. It don't, it don't happen. So I'm a realist. Um, on the day, it's all about if you, you know, are, are more prepared, if you've got more work rate, if you've got more desire, if you've got more quality. It's all those factors all in one. If you can have a higher percentage of those against the opposite, you've got more chance of winning. It doesn't matter who you're playing against. You know, we've 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 been there where. Uh, you know, we've all probably been an underdog and won the game. We've all been a favourite and lost to an underdog. So it's just really about preparing right and and, and getting getting the the right attitude. Now, if we perform to our optimum levels for those five games, and the opponents do as well, and it ends up that we lose all five games because of that, then you put your hand up and go. There's not really a lot else I can do. If you perform to those top levels and those have an off day, anything can happen as well. Mm -hmm. Once you get a run, you then start to get psychologically. You start to believe that actually we can we can win, we can beat these, we can beat these. We can it's beat also these. the hope that kills you as well. Absolutely, isn't it? And, and that's really important. That you know, it's no surprise that we went into the Michelover game with we didn't we didn't expect to win, mm. but we knew we were going to give it our all because that's the least we can do. We did the same away at Harrods Owen. We did the same away at Alf Church. That's no surprise that we got results there. We were unlucky against Nuneaton. We didn't play very well first half. We played well second half. Didn't win the game, lost to a better team, hands up. St Ives, we just went into that without the right mentality and, and we, we got fairly beaten. So the important thing is with those five games now is to you know, remember where we are. Sometimes heart, desire, blood, sweat and tears is the least you can do. And if you're good enough footballers, the, the talent will come through as well. Nice. Obviously, um, good luck Obviously, the rest of the season Thank and uh, we'll, be, we'll be over before the end yeah, of the season right. to see you again. Yeah, I appreciate your time tonight. Um, no problem. Thanks for coming in. And like you say, we'll see you in a few weeks over at Latimer Park. Yeah, no Cheers. 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 Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.